Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMY ZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Joseph Schachter, founder of the Schachter Energy Report online at SchachterEnergyReport.ca. He's speaking to us from Calgary. Welcome back to the show, Joseph. Glad to be with you, Jim. How big of an impact were all those forest fires having on the Alberta oil and gas patch? Well, uh, the first one, of course, is the fires and, uh, you know, the moving the people out of the communities impacted in the Drayton Valley and Grand Prairie area. Um, a lot of them were moved into, you know, uh, areas, communities to the to the east, some even up to Edmonton. Uh, there was talk in Calgary of, of, of getting ready to handle people here as well, um, and facilities were being organized for it in case the fires and the smoke started heading more south. But um, the companies in the industry, uh, if there were fires near their area, uh, drilling companies moved their rigs out. Uh, other companies shut in their production. Uh, to make sure that uh, there was no chance of fire. Um, whatever equipment they could bring out, they would. The people, you know, they would send helicopters or planes to fly over to make sure that uh, the, the fires weren't encroaching or if they were, uh, what they needed to do. Um, but and now as things are starting to get better, companies are putting out announcements that they're starting to bring production back up. Um, there's no fires in the area, but the smoke is still pretty bad. Um, and many schools in the province um, in, that are in areas that are affected by the quality of, of the air uh, don't allow their kids to be outside for, uh, you know, for the recess breaks. Uh, the air quality in Calgary is better today than it was two days ago. It was very dark and gloomy and, you know, a red sky, on, you know, when you're looking at the sun or the moon. It was uh, pretty horrible for a few days, but... We, if you remember a few years ago when they had the BC fires and the wind brought it to Alberta, you know, to the Calgary area, I think it was much worse. And this was maybe one bad, really bad day. But um, it's for people who have uh, breathing problems. It's probably still an issue for for them. And uh, so, um, you know, they're hoping w there was going to be rain this weekend. And if there's rain, that should hopefully clear the sky um, and get things better for next week. Right. So. Uh if Alberta's oil shut down, would that see a drastic hike in gasoline prices across Canada? I don't think so. You know, the amount of oil that's shut in, um, you know, relative to the amount of production we produce, you know, 5.8 million barrels, and we only consume about two, so maybe the exports to the, to the states will go slower. But the refineries in Canada will still run flat out. And again, they're they're preparing for summer gasoline grades, which are usually more environmentally tougher uh, grades than you have in the winter time. So the refiners are getting ready for the summer driving season, which is you know less than a month, or but just over a month away. And uh, so uh, I think you know, you know we may see you know the price of crude oil seventy two dollars for WTI. Um, my view is we're in a sixty four to seventy four price range over the next month or two. Um, I don't think we're going to go below the low we saw in um, in May, in March. So maybe you know 65, 66, maybe not that 64 uh, that we were at in mid March, um, and uh, the high maybe 74. So you know we're very you know we're we're closer to the high right now. Uh, but normally, once you get into June, the, the you know it's before, it's the shoulder season before the summer driving, and we're seeing in the states that demand is weakening as well in this shoulder season. Um, the EIA data that came out this week showed uh, that total demand was down by 606,000, but motor gasoline demand was down 395,000 to 8.9 million. So there is a slowdown historically at this time of year, 
and uh, then it picks up once we get into the July long weekend. Now, coming up on This Week in Money here on House Street, Wolf Richter is going to be talking about electric vehicles, and he said enough have been sold in the U.S. now to reduce gasoline consumption, even though the number of miles traveled has gone up. Uh, do we see an impact like that in Canada when it comes to uh, gasoline sales? Uh, I don't think you could really put a, a button on a, on a, a significant number yet. Uh, I think the penetration of EVs in Canada is less than the states. That's just my guess. Uh, I don't have any data to, to, to argue that. Uh, I think the key thing is the distances, um, you know, the charges and how long it takes to charge. Uh, the amount of charging stations across the country. You know, if you live in Toronto and you're going up to up to your place in Muskoka, do you really have enough uh, of a charge to get there? You know, uh, or do you need to stop? Uh, you know, if you're driving, uh, you know, uh, any length of distance in Alberta or Saskatchewan or Manitoba, you know, the charges are not going to be sufficient. So I think it's going to be only when we see uh, faster charging times and longer range on the batteries that I think you'll see penetration, especially in Western Canada, pick up. In the urban markets, you see a lot of Teslas in Calgary and, and Edmonton, uh, but, uh, you know, because people live here and they can charge up, uh, you know, in their community. Uh, but for long-distance driving, like for me, you know, uh, you know, if I'm the only real driving I do outside of in the city is going up to Edmonton to see family. And until I can have a car that I can charge up in Calgary, drive to Edmonton and, and come home, without having to stop and find a charging station, I'm really not interested in buying an EV. Any more talk of that hyperloop connection between Calgary and Edmonton? Uh, I think in the minds of politicians that assume there's a gravy train somewhere that's going to pay for it, uh, but, uh, you know, and also there's rail talk of a high-speed train uh, between Edmonton and Calgary, but, you know, we hear all of these, uh, you know, glory, glory projects um, and, of course, the economics really don't ma make sense. You know, we don't have the den density of population you have in Toronto and Montreal that a high-speed train would work there, and they don't have one. So, you know, or, you know, or the loop, or, you know, between Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, that corridor, um, you know, they don't even have them in the States in a lot of places So where you've got dense population. So I'm, I'm skeptical about uh, those things happening um, in my lifetime. Yes, and, and plus, once you get between Edmonton and Calgary, they're both cities where you really need a car to get around. That's true. Yeah, like I, I've talked to you know my you know Edmonton's airport is so far from the city. You know, to take a cab, you know, you, it's almost the same as the cost of a plane ride. So, no, I, I'm, I'm just being cynical there. But uh, you know, the reality is, you know, you, you'd need to rent a car or you know have my daughter come pick me up at the airport. But we drive up all the time. You know, it's a, it's a nice, comfortable three-hour drive. You stop in Red Deer, you know, for a bathroom break and a coffee, and and then maybe you know stop at the chapters and uh, you know find another good book to read. But uh, the reality is, uh, you know, um, you know, at this point, um, you know, EVs don't make any sense, and um, you know, I I I think that that's something um, that uh, you know, number one, a lot of people you know are are, are concerned about, uh, you know, the Teslas, uh, you know, with the, you know, the self-driving, they don't want to go near it um, because of the, the concern. You've seen some more accidents announcements today um, by a Tesla, you know, self-driving, taking over the car and getting, having an accident in the States. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, people now are saying I'm buying the car without it uh, just to make sure it doesn't over overtake, the, you know, them driving. Um, you know, some of them just like it for the parking. You know, that's the only feature they like. But, uh I think until we start seeing more of the mainline manufacturers offering product uh, and that the cost gets to be reasonable, um, you know, I think we're looking at something that's, uh, you know, the, the cost of cars have just become unaffordable um, in this inflationary time. You know, you've got, you know, the likelihood of taxes going up. Uh, you know, food inflation is not over. Wages have not kept up with, you know, as we saw from the, the CRA uh, employees, uh, you know, the receiver general employee is still on strike and, you know, the federal government employee is going back to work uh, with, but, you know, they, they say the wage component wasn't so big, but the benefits was obscene, was a, could be considered obscene, um, in terms of the, how generous they may have been. 
So we don't know the details yet, but um, if they got a very big wage increase, it's just going to make it tougher on the Bank of Canada, and it's going to make tougher on other employers who have to compete for the same type of workers. We'll have more with Joseph Schachter right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Joseph Schachter. Joseph, uh, last September, we saw gasoline prices in Vancouver hit $2.67 a litre, ten sixty eight a Canadian gallon. What kind of uh, gasoline prices are we looking at this year? Well, uh, I, if we, I think for the next number of months, as I said, we're between 64, 65, 66, let's say on the bottom for WTI up to 74. So whatever the price is right now, if it's 180 or 190, we're 146, I, I think, at Calgary right now. So we're looking at a range maybe between, uh, you know, 135 and maybe 160 through the summer. What, what I'm concerned about is that, uh, with the, uh, with the industry, um, you know, facing backlash from government, uh, you know, you have that line five potential problem in the states. Um, you know, Biden is, is continuing to push his, inv- you know, environmental agenda, anti-fossil fuel agenda. And if it looks like, you know, he's going to have a, a shot at being, uh, um, you know, getting the presidency for another four year term. I think we're looking at a, an anti-energy industry. Um, the best one probably is going to be natural gas, but heavy oil and uh, and and the you know coal will be in the gun sites of the environmentalists and climatologists, especially if we do have a very bad summer and a lot of fires uh, and record warm temperatures. Um, so I think that in the years ahead, uh, we're likely to see higher commodity prices. My expectation now. And we've been writing about that is sometime during Q4, we think we're going to get over $90 WTI. So from the 72 today to over 90, that's a big jump. And that potentially, if the industry doesn't respond with bringing on more production and the data from the U.S. EIA uh, that came out yesterday showed that the U.S. production fell 100,000 from a week ago from 12.3 to 12.2 million. Um, it's still up nicely from a year ago. Um, it's 12.2 year year to date versus 11.7. Uh, but if we start seeing the industry spend less money and uh, the drilling industry uh, cuts back uh, because of low natural gas prices uh, and you know stops drilling uh, as well, then we could be looking at much higher prices um, going into 2024. So if you're asking me, is there a chance for 250, 260 prices in BC in 2024? Um, I would put at least a one in three chance that you're going to see record prices next year again. Uh, what's the feeling in the oil and gas industry about new carbon taxes being imposed by Ottawa? Uh, if uh, Ottawa can put in new taxes, you know they're going to do it, uh, especially if they have the NDP backing them. Uh, you know, I, it's uh, I'm, you know we have an election here, uh, in, you know, just uh, you know in, in the 28th and. Uh, which is not that many days from now. Tonight at 6 o'clock in Calgary uh, or in Alberta, they have the uh, leaders' debate for an hour uh, on the major stations. So if anyone wants to tune in, and you know, locals can tune in on that. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we've heard already from the NDP they're going to raise the business taxes. Uh, and I think, you know, the governments have, uh, in general, big deficits, federally especially, um, that they're going to be looking for it. Uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who said, you know, people should be looking at their uh, their home uh, heating bill or electricity bill and look how much they pay for their natural gas and how much they pay for the climate taxes. And they may find that the climate taxes are bigger than what they paid for their usage of natural gas, which is pretty shocking. It just shows you how much the feds have already put on. Um, and then, of course, they're, they're still not finished. Now, the state of the industry in Alberta, how is it doing? Well, the industry, you know, the, you know, if, if you're in the oily side and you take into account the Canadian dollar different, you know, differential, you know, if you're getting, uh, you know, uh, 71, 72 for WTI and you're getting in mid-50s for WCS, 
you multiply that by the 1.36, 1.37 for the for the exchange rate, they're doing quite well. Uh, so the numbers are pretty good. The the problem is the two dollar handle on natural gas. And if you didn't put in uh, hedges, you know, when the good days were there, and you know, some companies in Q1 had four, five, and six dollar hedge books, uh, which helped out. But if you were in the spot market and you're getting two bucks, uh, you you know, you're not making much money. But if you have you know, 20% liquids, um, then you should be able to have enough uh, money coming in the door to pay for your CapEx and for any dividends that you might be paying um, and uh, and uh, keep, the, keep the lights going. But, um, you know, I'm in the optimistic camp that we're going to see both commodities do better in the, you know, in the weeks ahead. Uh, one, uh, if we do have a hot summer, we're all going to be using our air conditioners more so that's going to be a consumer of natural gas, especially with coal-fired facilities closed in Alberta. You may have seen Ontario announce uh, uh, just today, I think, that uh, they're going to be moving more towards uh, you know renewables, wind, and solar, but also to expanding their natural gas-fired uh, cogen facilities. So natural gas is going to be a big part of the solution uh, and meeting the needs that we need for electricity, um, because the problem you have is the you know. Um, in Quebec and Ontario, they're almost at the, the maximum capacity of the electric generation that they have today. Um, and of course, to try to do more hydro and nuclear takes a very, very long time. So the only one that can come on with reasonably quick, uh, uh, new capacity is, uh, the renewables and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, natural gas fired. And again, you still have approval issues there the NIMBY issue, not in my backyard. So um, if you're near a community that has a, 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 po- a political power base, then, um, you know, they're going to move it elsewhere. Well, Quebec has been opposed to natural gas lines uh, for the longest time, yet they want to heat their homes in the winter, don't they? Oh, yeah, they still use a lot of natural gas. And what's interesting is the Quebec Hydro is now maxed out. Uh, because they've sold so much uh, to the United States, they they thought, oh, we're going to be able to bring on more and more. And of course, the Americans were just hungry for it because it's clean electricity. So New York State and all the others bought up a ton of it, and then New York State put in the provisions. Oh, we're not going to allow uh, gas fired uh, or gas uh, um, gas uh, you know um, uh, ranges in houses anymore uh, in new construction. Um, and so you, you've got this anti-natural gas view there, uh, and they're all trying to sign up more Quebec Hydro. And, of course, Quebec gets it from Labrador. Um, so it, I think Newfoundland up, ends up in the driving uh, seat now with Labrador, because if they want to do more uh, facilities in Labrador, they're going to have to give Newfoundland not a rape job. Uh, they're going to have to give them an economic job that justifies them giving the support. So I think for, for, you know, instead of uh, Quebec benefiting so much from what they've done uh, to, you know, to, to Labrador and Newfoundland, it looks like Newfoundland's going to be at the, you know, at the, at the, at the, seat, at the table getting more for them. And if, and if the Quebec government doesn't want to pay for it itself, then it's going to have to be Ottawa that says to Newfoundland, okay, here's what we're going to do for you to get you at the table to sign off on this. Now, Europe would love to have Canadian natural gas instead of having to rely on Russia. Why aren't we uh, building facilities to ship it that way? Well, the east coast of Canada, you know, Quebec doesn't want pipelines through them. Uh, there's been, a no- you know, lots of, you know, proposals that, that did, or a number of proposals that have been canceled recently, as you may re- remember. Um, and uh, it looks like the only way we're going to get LNG is going to be, uh, you know, well, two ways. One is going to, of course, be the LNG on the West Coast and LNG Canada coastal gas pipeline are being built. LNG Canada is expected to announce the second train. So we'll go from 2.1 to, 4, to 2, 4.2 BCF there. Cedars has gotten approval from the B.C. government and some approvals from the feds. Um, and then you've got wood fiber and you've got other projects in the queue. So right now there's about 17 BCF being produced in Western Canada. That's slowly falling down a little bit because of lack of drilling. And we've got this potential into the end of the decade of another 7 BCF of upside. That's why I'm most bullish about natural gas, because they're not going to drill and bring this on unless the economics are there. And it ain't going to be there at $2. You're going to need 
five to seven dollar gas, which would be very uh, very beneficial to the companies and would attract enough capital to bring on enough gas to meet the potential export markets. The other choice is uh, some of the uh, infrastructure companies are talking about expanding infrastructure from Canada down to the Gulf Coast so that we may end up benefiting by sending Canadian gas into the LNG plants in the Gulf Coast. Right now, um, you've got uh, Tourmaline and ARC are the only Canadian companies that are big enough to be able to contract um, to the uh, Chenier's and, uh, you know, the LNG producers on the Gulf Coast. Um, but uh, over time, uh, we could see, you know, more companies getting the benefit with the help of the uh, major infrastructure companies like Enbridge and TC Energy. Joseph, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on? I heard there could be a diesel shortage this fall. Yeah, that, I don't know enough about that. Uh, again, though, with the, you know, if we expect a decent economy and truckers busy, um, and, you know, the, we really have a limit on our refining capacity in Canada. So I, that, that would not be something that, that, that I wouldn't, you know, disagree with. But I think people should realize that the energy stocks are extremely cheap. Uh, they've been beaten up. Some of them are trading at 50 cents on the dollar versus a year ago in June when we had the highs in the market. So to us, we think there's bargains out there. We also think that there's going to be a bit more of a correction here into June. Uh, but we got our, our great buy signals, uh, two of them in March. We expect to get more buy signals in, in uh, mid to late June. And uh, for investors out there, when we get these kind of corrections, when these bargains are available, it definitely makes sense to be investors. And that's what we're doing with our product uh, is giving ideas to investors on what the bargains are out there so that they can determine for themselves based on what fits their portfolios um, and uh, they can they can buy them just for example um, in march a number of the large cap uh, pipeline and infrastructure companies got down to seven percent dividend yields and they have the grow the capability of growing those dividends three to five percent so if you can buy it at the right price get a seven percent yield you know compare that to what you can get in the bank and have some capital appreciation, those are great total return securities, and you'll do even better in the E&P and the energy service stocks. So we think people should be doing their homework and waiting for the next low-risk entry point and taking advantage of the bargains out there because we're not going to stop using fossil fuels in my lifetime, uh, and uh, you know the industry is focusing on doing the, the best they can do environmentally with the technology that's available today, and they're working on sp- and spending money on trying to find new technologies that will make things even cleaner uh, for the industry going forward. So our industry is, you know, has not stood up for themselves as much as they should based on what they're doing, um, and I think that uh, as people realize you know, what's going on and get more information, uh, I think they'll realize that uh, the industry has responded uh, and that uh, uh, there are a lot of companies out there that are worth uh, owning um, for many, many years to come. Joseph, thank you so much for chatting with us. My pleasure as always. My guest has been Joseph Schachter, founder of the Schachter Energy Report online at schachterenergyreport.ca. He was speaking to us from Calgary. If you have any questions for Joseph or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Find us on Twitter at Street. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.